I'm going to use the whiteboard a little bit probably just to highlight some of the things I want to say. But um, this evening I want to talk a, l a little bit more on, on the subject of what sin really is. And um, the reason why I'm doing this is because I know that <laughs> this is one of the, the issues that has been a, 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 con a contentious issue. It has been an issue in, in, the, in the ranks of the independent believers for a long, long time. And now those of us who believe in the truth about God, it has been an, it has been an issue am, am, among us. And um, it continues to be an issue right here in, in Arizona. I know. I've, I've, I understand that there are differing opinions and it's, it's very strong everywhere you go. And um, I would like to help us to understand what our position is. I'd like us to be very clear on it and I'd like us to understand why do we believe the way we believe. I think once any reasonable person comes to the Bible and you look at it closely, there are not two different ways. It's a, it's a real mystery to me to understand why there are these differing opinions because, you know, there's one group who says sin is only what you do. Sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. This is the only definition of sin. There's another group who says, well, sin is more than what you do. Sin involves your very nature. And um, when we say this, I, I, I belong to that, to that camp. And when we say this, people say, you are teaching holy flesh. You are teaching that Jesus was not like us because obviously if Jesus was like us and we have, a sin, uh, we have sin in us, then Jesus must have had sin in him. These are some of the arguments. So we want to just see what the Bible says and we want to reason about it because I don't think... It's, it's reasonable to read the Bible and not think about what you're reading, which is what some people say. They say, when you reason, it's your own opinion. I don't know whose opinion you're supposed to have. Because when you read, you're supposed to understand. If you understand it that way, I understand it this way. We need to reason about it. Now, I'll just quickly say that um, I mentioned these names yesterday. I just want to um, give a face to some of the, 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 the names. Um, Dennis Preby, I'm sure most of us have heard of Dennis Preby and we know him. He's not really a person who believes as we do about the Godhead. He's a Trinitarian, but he's one of the, the foremost advocates in, in the independent movement among independent Adventists. He's one of the foremost advocates of the idea that sin is what you do and it can be nothing else. And um, Ralph Larson was also, he's now dead, but he, he was also a very strong advocate of this. And um, these are the two men who I would say are they form the foundation of what most people believe who think that sin is only what you do. These two men are at the foundation of it. And um, they usually quote these men, especially Dennis Preeby. I, I was a believer in what Dennis Preeby teaches. In 1993 or thereabouts, I got some of his tapes and I listened to them. And he convinced me. And my father tried to show me, I, I, I don't think that that is right, David. And look, we argued and we argued, my father and I. And um, he didn't convince me, but he was right. And I was wrong. But it took, me, it took me years before I could understand because I didn't understand righteousness by faith. I was still focusing on working my way into heaven. I was still focusing on being good by obeying the law. And I didn't understand that righteousness is a gift and victory over sin is a gift I did not understand. And this man here, he convinced me, and so we had a lot of arguments back in our little home church um, for many years. In the, in, the, in, in, the, in the Godhead movement, in the Truth About God movement, some of the people who um, believe like them are Brother David Sims. I know that they have a group of believers not too far from here who, who are affiliated with, with David Sims. Alan Stump, who was my friend for many years until we split up over this thing. When I, when I changed my belief about what sin is, he went east 
and I went west. I stayed, and he went east. <laughs> I would have to say, all right, brother, what's correcting me? And there's also Bill Pinto, who is in charge of restitution ministries in Australia, who is a very strong opponent of what we now believe. So, anyway, I wanted to just identify, just put some faces to the names so you have an idea of where things are. Brother Howard and myself, we belong to Restoration Ministries, now renamed. We now are renamed. We are now Open Face Fellowship because it turned out that in order to be able to handle money, we had to register with the government and we could not use the name Restoration Ministries because it was already being used by somebody else somewhere. So we, we had to change the name. Now, now we are Open Face Fellowship. And um, it's, it's the same name as the newsletter we have been producing for years, so it shouldn't be too hard to remember. Brother Howard and myself, we are, we are firmly believers. We are firm believers in, in, the, in the idea that sin is more than what you do. Sin is a condition. Sin is a word that describes the very nature that a person has before he finds Christ. I can also speak for Brother Nader, Mansour and Brother Imad, who, who are from Revelation 14, 12 ministry. They happily, I am happy to say, also understand the way we understand. Now I'm saying this because I'm not, I'm not trying to stir up controversy, but it exists. And I'm not going to pretend it doesn't exist because these are the people who told people not to come to this meeting. The people who believe that, that sin is exclusively what you do, they say we are teaching the Catholic doctrine of original sin. They told people not to come to this meeting. And there are people who didn't come because they told people not to come. So I'm not going to be naive or, or, or pretend, pretend that there's not a situation that exists because it affects our meeting. So I'm going to say, this, this is the philosophy behind that, and it, 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 it's, it's not going away, okay? As long as this movement about the truth about God exists and it's going forward, you should know that in the middle of it, there is this controversy that splits it in two. So, we all believe similarly about God, but, all our, but our beliefs are not equal. Because I believe even how we view God and how we view Jesus is affected by how we view this question. Now, let me scribble a little bit on the, on the board here. I want to ask a question. Okay? Just because I want us to keep this in mind. Why? All right? I don't want to be a contentious debating fool. I don't want to argue for argument's sake, okay? They say the theologians get together sometimes, some of the things they talk about. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? I hope I don't, get it. I don't become that stupid. I don't want to argue about what is sin so I can win an argument. I want to argue about it because it's important. Now, why do I need to understand what is sin? There, there are, two, there are two, two reasons that exist in Adventism. The first reason is this. Adventists want to be able to prove to Sunday worshippers that they are wrong. That's the first reason. Okay? They want to prove that the law is still relevant and that the law is still something that we must uphold. And they believe that if you can say to a Sunday keeper... Sin has to do with the law. That's, that's a good approach to make him understand that the law is still vital and you can't do away with the law. If you do away with the law, you do away with sin. You have seen the illustrations. C.D. Brooks has, a, has one where he has some children come up in front and then he says, if there's no law, there's no sin. If there's no sin, there's no grace. If there's no grace, there's no need for Jesus. And he goes through the thing, right? But that's the argument. That's the basis of that argument. It's a, re, it's a way of proving that the Sabbath is still relevant. So you pin sin to the law. 
You pin sin to the law. And so because you have pinned sin to the law, you can, you can prove that if you take away the law, you take away sin. Because sin cannot exist outside of the law. You have made your case. Seems like it's foolproof. But honestly, it leads to legalism. And what is legalism? Legalism is a concept where you orient your life according to the rule of law. That's what legalism is. Don't let anybody, anybody define it in the way that pleases them. Legal means having to do with law. Legalism is a condition where you orient your life or you run your life according to the rule of law. It's a natural approach of human beings because everything in human experience is run by legal law. The government is run by legal law. The school is run by, 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 by laws. Your social club, your youth club, your, 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 your everything. Every organization is run by legal law because humanity knows no other way. But I'm here to tell you that there's one institution that runs without legal law. And it is the government of God. Why? Because there's only one government in the universe that can rule from inside of men. The only government in existence that can rule from the inside is the government of God. And if you can get inside a person's heart and impart your philosophy, your thinking, your nature to that person, you don't need legal law. You don't need legal law. Legal law is for people who, 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 who are contrary to what you are trying to present. Therefore, the scripture says in... in um, let me get this out of the way because I just wanted to show that and then I'm going to. The scripture says, and I'll show it to you. In 1 Timothy 1, verses 8 and 9, I want to read this verse here as soon as I can get to it. 1 Timothy 1, look at what it says here in verses 8 and 9. Where am I? First, so oh, I'm in Second Timothy. Sorry about that. First Timothy one eight and nine. Here's what it says. Now we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. The law is not made for a righteous man. Look here, if I had said that, they would have cut off my neck. But I didn't say it. Paul said it. They can grumble behind his back, but they can't change what Paul said. All right? The law is not made for a righteous man. But for who? For the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. That's who the law is made for. Why? And does it make sense? I'm going to explain it to you because this is one of the... the, 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 the the perspectives, this is one of the things that is most misunderstood by our people. Most misunderstood. There is not one, there's not one in 10,000 Adventists who understand the truth about the law. And this is what God was trying to change in 1888 when, when, when he, he brought that message. He was trying to change our understanding of the law and it never happened. And today people who think that 1888 is something we understand, they're dreaming. They're dreaming. I thought I understood what, 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 what it was about. I did not. And today when you try to present the truth about the law, you become public enemy number one. Look, what Paul is saying is this, okay? Let me use my gross example that I like to use. Because it's very effective. You see a sign on the door. You come here this morning and there's a sign on the door that says, please don't spit on the floor. You think that's very strange. But it comes to your mind that that, that rule is put there for what? Why? There's somebody around who likes to spit on the floor. That's why they put a rule there. You don't put rules in place unless there is a tendency to, to behave a certain way. And you want to change that behavior, so you make a rule. Where there is not a tendency to behave a certain way, no rule is necessary. When Christ lives in a person and his nature is transformed and he desires only to do what Christ wants to do, what is the sense of a, of a legal law 
What is the sense of saying to, to, to an angel, thou shalt not commit adultery? Because angels are not male or female. What's the point of saying to an angel, honor your mother and your father, when angels don't have mothers? What's the, what's the sense of saying to God, thou shalt love your enemies? When God has no instinct in him, nothing in him but love. For God, a rule is useless. For, for those who are in Christ and whose natures have been changed by the Spirit of Christ, those rules are useless. They, they are unnecessary. Those rules are made for people who, whose Spirit leads them in the other direction. And we don't understand it. We don't understand. Now, the law is made for the lawless, disobedient, and ungodly. So, why do we need to define sin? Is it that we can debate with Sunday worshippers? Okay. If that's what you want, fine. All right? Go, 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 go win your debates, right? But if you are interested in, in living a holy life, that is not going to help you at all. That debating definition is not going to help you. The reason why we want to understand what is sin is because we want to understand how to overcome sin. We want to understand our problem. This is why we need to define sin. Not to win a debate, but to understand the true problem and how to deal with it. Now, this is where our perspective, our approach is different from these other brethren. Because, like I say, I don't want to impugn motives to people. But this focus on the law, it's legalism. It leads to legalism. It leads to the place where you are more interested in winning arguments than in understanding the way of Christ. Now, when it comes to the question of how to deal with sin, you must understand the nature of the beast. You must understand the nature of the beast that you are dealing with. If you don't understand the nature of the beast, you can be over here chopping off the leaves of the tree. You want mangoes, and the, thing is, the cursed thing is bearing apples. And you want mangoes. So you go and every time you see you see an apple up here, you chop it off and you chop off the limb, okay? And you, you'll be chopping for a long, long time. And you're not going to win the battle because you don't understand the problem that you're dealing with. You're chopping off limbs and you're picking apples, you want mangoes, and you're expecting that to work. That is how people approach it based on the first definition. They're trying to change their behavior when that is not really the problem. And that is what Adventists do not understand. And our dear brethren who are wanting to crucify us because we say otherwise, they don't understand. Sometimes it seems like they don't want to understand. And that is tragic. Now, they will tell you that the Bible says, 1 John 3 and verse 4. In fact, they will even say, Ellen White says it is so. I think, I think, I think when Sister White says, the only definition of sin is 1 John 3 and verse 4. Ellen White was in a, in a church that was under attack from the Sunday-keeping denominations. Seventh-day Adventism were new Sabbath keepers back in the days of Ellen White. They were just growing and making a name in the world. And they were, they were criticized from churches everywhere. Ellen White, like all Adventists, wanted to be able to defend their position regarding the Sabbath. When she says, if I'm talking to a, a, a Sunday-keeper who is trying to tell me the Sabbath is done away with, I would say, where do you find the definition of sin? You find it in the law, okay? Because in the context of the discussion, that point is necessary. But if, if I'm dealing with the problem of sin, my problem of sin, and you give me that, what are you telling me? You are telling me that my problem is, is, is caused by my behavior. Sin is my behavior. Sin is the actions that I do in breaking the law. So, so the, the, what am I to understand? The solution to the problem is to change my behavior. If the problem is behavior, then the solution is behavior. Can a sinner change his behavior in order to become a non-sinner? Is that the way to solve the problem? Yet you come to that logical conclusion if you accept what these brethren say about sin, that it is exclusively your behavior. It's like sometimes they don't even read the rest of the Bible because Romans 14 and verse 23 says, um, Whatsoever is not of faith 
is sin. All right, that's another one. Maybe they didn't read that one. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. There's another definition for you. And we're not going to go by definitions, but I'm just interested in reading a few others. James, James uh, 2 and verse 17 says, James 4 and verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Third definition. 1 John 5 and verse 17 says, All unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. So, so the idea that the Bible only gives you one understanding of sin is not really correct. So, I'm not going to ask. The first question was why. I hope you, you understand what I was trying to say here. Um, I'm not going to ask what is the definition. I'm not going to ask what is the definition. Okay? I'm going to ask... What is the understanding okay we are not going to look at the definition of sin because people get so legalistic look this is what it says sin is and there you have the definition what we are going to do instead is look at the understanding okay let's see if we can do that because you can define all you want if you don't understand what you are dealing with it won't help you. So let's look at the understanding. We're going to try to understand sin. Now, there's a passage in the Bible that we're going to go through, we're going to go to, and we're going to take some time in looking at it. And, um, you know, the person who, the, the, there are two persons who are most, who are most, what should I say, who are strongest in the Bible in teaching what I'm trying to, what we're, I'm trying to share this evening. And they are, to me, they are the two greatest authorities in the New Testament. All right? One is Jesus Christ. You can't get more authoritative than that. And the second one is the Apostle Paul. And I'll tell you something. The only person whose opinion means more to me than, than Paul is Jesus. The only person in the Bible means more to me than Paul is Jesus Christ. And I don't apologize for that. You might have your preferences, right? Some people prefer Moses. Some might prefer prefer Peter, some might prefer James, a lot, of, a lot prefer James, but I'll tell you, there's a reason why Paul has written more than half of the New Testament. There's a reason why God made more than half of the New Testament written by Paul. There's a reason why Paul could say, if even an angel from heaven comes and teaches you something different from what I say, let the angel be accursed. Man, how could any human being, so, being be so presumptuous to make a statement like that? Let the angel be accursed. But Paul knew what he was saying because Jesus Christ personally taught Paul what the gospel is. And I tell you, he understood it better than any of the other apostles. He understood it better. So I have a great deal of joy and a great deal of confidence when I go to the, the writings of Paul in trying to understand these issues. And as I said, Jesus is the other person who defines sin in this way. And I, we're just going to look at two places where this kind of definition comes up. In John 8 and verse 34, here's Jesus. Jesus says, Verily, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. All right, look at that last phrase. Servant of sin. I ask you the question, in this place, how do you define or how do you understand sin is jesus here using the word sin to refer to transgression of the law he said if you if you commit sin that's transgression of the law you are the servant of sin two different ways he's using the same word right you commit sin that's an act right you are the servant of sin is that also an act the second time he uses the word, the second time he uses the word sin, this is an action. This is a verb. You commit, well, it's not even a verb. You commit sin. You commit an act of sin. But it's based on an action. You commit, okay? You are the servant of sin. This is what? A noun. 
Here he is using the word sin to describe something that is your master. Something that controls you. You become its servant. Sin is your master. If you commit sin, if you commit the action of sin, it's because you are the servant of a master whose name is sin. That's a different understanding of sin. That's not, that's not covered by 1 John 3, 4 at all. It's a different understanding of sin. You commit sin because there's something, something that is controlling you called sin, and you are its servant. Okay, Jesus says this, and I'm going to go to the passage now, which, which uh, from the writings of Paul, which further clarifies this. And we're going to take some time and go through this passage. We're going to the book of Romans, and I'm going to Romans chapter 7. Now, I would like to, I would like to take the time and go through every single verse, but I, I, we don't have the time to do it. But it's one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible, and yet it is one of the most beautiful passages in helping us to understand. Any, any, anybody who reads Romans 7 and understands what it's, it's saying will not remain in the kind of ignorance that a lot of Christians are in. No, your understanding will change. And we're going to try to go through and see. If you, if you have any questions, please put up your hand. Know ye brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. And so am I, I'm speaking to people who know the law. How that the law has dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Look at this word. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. What does the word dominion mean? Rulership or authority. Control. As long as you live according to the law, because Paul is, is now referring to the law given by Moses, given by, by God through Moses. And he says, according to the law, the law is to control your life as long as you live. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Now we're, we're going to be, be, be um, Paul is talking about, let me use different colors. He's talking about a woman. And she has a husband. She has a husband. And she is, how can I represent this? She is bound to this husband. They're tied together. I don't know how else to represent it. She's bound to this husband. As long as he lives, what is it that binds them together? According to the, the statement, she's bound by the law to her husband as long as he's alive. So, it is the law The law has dominion. It dominates the life of this man and this woman, right? It dominates their life and it controls them. As, and, and the law says, as long as you are alive, as long as any of them is alive, you are tied together. Now, that's what the law says. Because he, he, in the Bible, divorce is not something that God wants. And the law, the law says, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. And so... That's the understanding. It's the law that keeps you in that relationship. But if the husband be dead, if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So if, if the man dies, if the man happens to die, then this no longer applies. Okay? She's no longer bound to her husband. And so the law no longer controls the relationship because the husband is dead. Verse 3 says, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So, I'm going to put another man in the picture because there is another man in the picture, okay? There's another man in the picture over here. Um... I'm going to call this man, I'm going to put a C there, okay? Now, it doesn't matter if she wants to be married to this man. She has to remain married to her first husband, and the law puts, keeps her that way. But if he dies, 
Now she's free to marry to this man. Now she's free to have a new husband because the old one is dead. So she says, Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So a new relationship is formed. What he's really talking about is not marriage, is not common marriage. He's talking about the relationship with Christ. That's what he's talking about, right? The woman represents you in some kind of way. The husband, we're going to find out what this is. And the new husband represents Christ. So here are you. You are this woman. And you want to be married to this man who is Christ. But there's an obstruction because you, you are married to somebody else. And the law is keeping you in that relationship with this somebody else. And the only way you can get out of this relationship, according to the law, is if this somebody dies. But if this somebody dies, then you can be married to Christ. Now before we go any further, I want to ask a question. Who do you think this first husband is? You said self and Satan. You said the carnal nature, which I'm agreeing with. Okay? It's not the law. It's the law who keeps you there. This first husband is not the law. The law is keeping you in a relationship. And who, who would you say the woman is then? Who would you say this woman is? If this is a carnal self, who is the woman? I would say the woman represents your conscience or your, 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 the, the mind that wants to be free. But you're married to the carnal self, right? So what Paul has done, he has split you into two parts. He says there's a carnal part that controls the desire of your conscience. Your conscience wants to do what's right, but the carnal part is married to, 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 the con is married to, to, to your conscience. In other words, you are bound together as a whole person. Now, he says something interesting, and he says the law keeps you in that relationship. Which I'm going to explain. The law keeps you in that relationship. The only way you can escape from this relationship is if the carnal self dies. Then you can be married to Christ. Now we're going to see how the law keeps you in that relationship. But let's go, go on and see what else Paul has to say. Wherefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to what? Dead to the law. Okay. My friends don't like to hear that. When you are dead to something, what does that mean? It means it has no effect on you. All right? I, I, I could say, I used to be an alcoholic, but now I'm dead to alcohol. Maybe it wouldn't be quite true because maybe when I see it, I have a little twitching. I have a little desire. Maybe. So I wouldn't be quite dead. But dead is like you have always been a, 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 a carnal person. You, are, you have always been weak in sexual matters. Okay? And so you die and you are lying in the coffin. And they parade a string of half-naked women in front of you. And you don't bat an eye. It has no more effect on you. That's what it means to be dead to something. Something has no more effect on you. Paul says, you have become dead to the law. What he's saying, and this is why it is so difficult for Adventists to understand, what he's saying is that now that you are married to Christ, the law is no longer the thing that dominates your life. It no longer has dominion because the law was made for carnal people, right? Now here's the thing. As long as you are married to the carnal side, the law is in control of your life. Because who was the law made for? The law is made for carnal people. So as long as you are relating to the law, you are keeping yourself as what? You are keeping yourself in a, as a carnal person. You are trying to approach life on the basis of responding to a set of rules. That is a way of life for carnal people. It's not a way of life for born again people. Do you see what I'm saying? When you are responding to God on the basis of a set of rules, you are behaving as a carnal person. You are behaving as a person who, whose nature is still bad and who, who still needs these restraints. Effectively, 
you're operating on the level of carnality. Paul is saying, when you have the carnal person has died, you are dead to the law because the law was specifically designed for this person. So you're now dead to the law. God is going to take you into a relationship where you're operating from the same principle as how Jesus operates. Jesus does not love his enemies because the law says so. Jesus does not avoid killing because a law says so. Jesus does not keep the Sabbath because a rule says so. Jesus is simply living the life that his nature impels him to live. And it's in harmony with the law, but not because of the law. It's because of his new nature. When he is married to you, you operate on the same principle. That's what Paul is saying. You can understand perhaps why Our, our brethren, our brethren, they are, so, they are so opposed to what I'm trying to say. Because it sounds to some people like I'm saying the law is done away with, which is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the law, well, Paul says it later on. We're going to read where Paul says the law is holy and the law is just and the law is good. Holy, just and good is okay, but holy, just and good cannot make me a better person. I, I, I need to live on, on a principle other than an external rule. When I, was, when I was a boy, I tell this story, I've told this story before many times, but it's still true. Okay? Two things stand out in my mind. My mother used to um, always give me porridge every morning. My mother had this misguided idea that porridge makes you fat. Look at me. <laughs> it never worked. And every morning, she, had, she ended up with 10 children. She didn't have time to waste. Every morning, she put the porridge on the table, drink, and she put the strap in her waist, and she went to the kitchen. If she came back and the porridge was still on the table, look here, she would beat everybody. One morning, I drank up my porridge, and I was sitting there, and it was after I got my beating, <laughs> she realized that I had finished my porridge. But look here, I learned to hate porridge. Okay, the lump, especially when it has lumps, I, it cannot pass my throat. And it's that way with all my, my siblings. We hate porridge and we hate porridge with lumps. No, no, don't even show it to me. So, because of that, I never ate porridge for the rest of my life. Not true. Not true. When I became a man, my wife cooks porridge for me and I drink it. Well, I make sure there's no lump. But I, I drink porridge, right? Because when I was a boy, I drank porridge because my, it was my mother's rule. I didn't like it. I had to. Because if I didn't do it, there was a penalty. My mother's rule had dominion over my life and I had to submit to it. Today, that no longer controls my life. I can do as I please. So why do I drink porridge? Because my nature has changed. My understanding is different, okay? And I'm able to deal with this on a diff in a different way. So I don't need my mother's law anymore. I don't need it. Because my own nature now makes me drink it from time to time. Okay? So, so it's kind of like an illustration as to how the law was supposed to work. When your nature is contrary to the direction God wants you to do, law is necessary. Because the law prevents anarchy. The law stops you from, from, from becoming too barefaced in wrongdoing. But that is not God's intention to give you life in that way. Because it's not God's intention. See what Paul says in Galatians chapter um, Galatians 3 and verse 21, I believe. He says... Um, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. That's the point. You can't get life out of the law. All you can get is conformity. You can get conformity. You can behave as the law demands. But it can't make you righteous. Behavior does not make a person righteous. You can beat a dog until he stops barking. It won't make him in, in, into a, a, another kind of animal. You can, you can lock up a sinner and you can put him through 
You can, you, you can put him through all kinds of torture. He will conform, but he won't change. Law brings conformity, not change, and that is a problem. The best you can get out of a law is an outward conformity, which usually and very often is nothing but hypocrisy. That's the best the law can do for you. Well, it is true the law prevents people from cutting one another's throats and from shooting each other and from taking another person's wife. It kind of control, uh, gives some restraint to the spread of sin, but it cannot produce righteousness. So if we are looking at the question of righteousness by faith, please take the law out of the picture because it does not work. You can't produce righteousness by behavior. And that's the point. That's the point. That is why this argument is here, because we are trying to solve the problem of the sin that continues to plague us, not to win arguments with Sunday keepers. So, um, back, to, back to Romans. Paul says in verse 5, Back to Romans 7. For when we were in the flesh. Now notice here. Where does he put the flesh experience? In the past. Are you in the flesh? If you are a Christian, you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. Do not tell me that we are still sinners. Do not tell me that we are still in this carnal condition. Absolutely not. If you accept what Paul is saying, he's putting that, that, that in the past. You are in the flesh before you meet Christ. When we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law. I tell you, I had to study this myself because I never read it in any of our books. And I never heard it in, in any of the sermons. The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. And it's hard to understand. How does the law bring sin? How does it create the motions of sin? I'll tell you how. This, this is so, such a, 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 a wonderful understanding of the situation. It's so, it's so deep that it's hard to get across in one session. It's hard to get across. But here's the point. Let me see if I can do it. The issue is this. The problem is not what you do. The problem is that your nature is opposed to the nature of God. That's the problem. Not what you do. Look here. Many of the great heroes that we admire in the Old Testament were killers. Okay? God said to David he could not build the temple because he had shed too much blood. Yet David was said to be a man after God's own heart. It is not what you do that is so important. It's the fact that your heart is contrary to the heart of God. That is why... Sunday keepers will be in the kingdom. Many of them. I'm not saying all. Many Sunday keepers will be in the kingdom. And many Sabbath keepers will be out of the kingdom. Because it's not so much the rule that you conform to. It's the harmony of your heart with God. That is what sin is about. Okay? So when you define sin as a set of behaviors, you go to church on Saturday and you make sure you don't, you don't invade your neighbor's house and you say, I am one of God's commandment keeping people. Look here. And your heart is contrary to the heart of God. You spend your money how you like. You don't sit beside the sister in church because the law says nothing about these things, right? You run your own life, you make your own decisions, and you think you're okay because you're keeping ten rules? You think that that is a problem? No. The problem is that you are in a condition where you are opposed to the mind of God. I have learned, and this is where, by God's grace, I want to be a complete overcomer. I've learned that if God wants me to be in Jamaica and I'm in Arizona, this is what sin is about. This is what sin is about. It is to be, if God wants me to be a millionaire and I choose to be a pauper, I'm outside of God's mind. 
If God wants me to be a pauper and I choose to be a millionaire, I'm outside of his mind. If he wants me to go and sweep the streets and I choose to be a business executive, I'm out of his will. Sin is being contrary to the mind of God. It's not breaking ten rules. Now, until we, brothers and sisters, until our people come to understand sin in this light, you think we're ever going to be what God wants us to be? You think we're ever going to be what God wants us to be? Living pious, respectable lives outside of the will of God. That is the problem with sin. And if we don't recognize sin and deal with it accordingly, brothers and sisters, we are going nowhere. Even though we know the truth about God and we understand about the kingdom, if we don't understand the true nature of the beast, we can't deal with it. We don't even know how to approach it. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that the motions of sin were by the law. In fact, let me go down a little further because it's brought out further down. He says, but now we are delivered from the law. Hmm. I didn't know we needed to be delivered from the law. Now we are delivered from the law. We are set free from the dominion of the law. How come? That being dead, wherein we were held. The thing that held us is now dead, which is what? The carnal mind ourself. Since that is dead, now we are no longer under the dominion of the law. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we are serving God now in the newness of the spirit, which is, which is Christ in us, the spiritual meaning of the law, the principle of the law, not the letter. And the principle of the law is simply this. I now possess the loving nature of God. That's the spirit of the law. All the law is based upon this principle of love, but you can't create love in a person. You have to have the spirit in you before you can love. As Romans 5 and verse 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Can you finish? Maybe we should look at it. I like to know that we prove all things so we can hold fast to what is good. Romans 5 and verse 5, it says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. I always think when my friends tell me, look, the greatest commandment is to love, I say, fine, go and try to keep it. It's worse than the Ten Commandments. You tell me to love my enemies? It's worse. It's harder. So don't tell me it's a better commandment. The new covenant is not a commandment. It's a gift. God has shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and he has done for us what we could not do. I love my enemies because the Spirit of God is in me pouring out love upon my enemies. Not because a rule tells me to do it. That's the joy of what Christ has done for us. He has given me instead of demanding of me. And if we don't understand this issue properly, Man, we always get a hold of the wrong side of the, of the, of the equation. Um, back to that passage in Romans 7. So we go back down to um, verse 5, 6. Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, here is where our friends jump on this verse and it says, I had not known sin but by the law. You know what they think? If it were not for the law, you could not define sin. Wrong! That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you need the law to define sin. In this chapter, you have to ask yourself the question, What? is sin. If you don't get that right, you don't know what he's saying. Let's go down a little further and see what sin is. Let me look at verse 21, I think. All right, 20 will be just as good. Let's start with verse 17. Look at what Paul says. Let me start with verse 16. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. He's saying the same thing like what Jesus said in John 8 and verse 34. It's sin that dwelleth in me. Now in this chapter, how is Paul understanding sin? 
He is seeing sin as a negative power that is living inside of him and dominating or controlling his life, right? There's a negative power inside of him controlling his life. And he's saying, it is sin that is causing me to do these things. When you go down a little further, he says it again. Verse 20. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. All right, so... He's actually going back to this and he's calling this fellow here, the first husband. He's referring to this husband as sin. Because the wife wants to do what is good. But the husband is dominating and controlling her life. And she cannot do what, is, what she wants to do. So he has to die. So Paul is speaking of the experience of a person who is under the law. But has not been born again. You want to know who the man in Romans 7 is? They argue about it. Theologians debate about it. They say, Paul says that he could not do the things that he wanted to do. And sin was dwelling in him. Rubbish! Paul is not speaking about himself as a Christian. He, he has put himself in the place of a man who is under the law. A man who knows the law is good. Who wants to do the law. But who has not been married to Christ. Who is still married to the carnal person. And he's showing you that the man in this condition is a tormented soul. You cannot do what you want to do. You cannot do what the law d demands of you. And yet you can't get away. You don't know what to do. This is the condition of this man. And um, because look what he says. Uh, look what he says in verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. This is what he's talking about. This, this is the part that delights in the law of God. But I see another law in my members. This fellow. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So, you all know that the husband is the head of the wife. So, as long as you are married to the carnal um, side, the carnal mind, it is impossible to do what is good. Your conscience bothers you all the days of your life, but you will never change. You have got to have a different head. Christ has, be has to become your head. And it only happens when you... When you turn to Christ in faith, he puts the old husband to death and you get married to him. You are no longer under the dominion of the law because if you go back under the dominion of the law, you again turn to car the car carnality. You are again operating on carnal principles. You have eliminated Christ out of the way, right? That's why Paul says, if I do not frustrate the grace of God, because if righteousness come by the law, Christ died in vain. Galatians 2 and verse what? 21, I think it is, right? So, this is what Paul says. I see this other law in my memory. So, so what he's saying is that in Paul's thinking, sin is not an act of transgression. Sin is a, is a, is a, is a negative power that is dominating your life. So, let's go back to that verse in verse 8, I think it is. When he says, I would not have known sin but by the law. Is he talking about, I would not have known how to define sin? Think about it. How, how does Paul understand sin here? What have we seen? Paul is understanding sin as a master that lives inside of the carnal person, right? So when Paul says, I would not have known sin, what he's saying is, what he's saying is, here am I. All right? This is me. There is a little fellow lurking inside here. His name is Sin. I didn't know about this fellow. I did not know he was there. I thought, like most sinners think, they're quite naive and quite foolish. They say, anytime I want to become a Christian, I'm going to change, right? They think that they can do Righteousness when they want. Okay, that's what most sinners believe. So what does God do? God gives a law. And the law says to this person, he says to me, thou shalt not covet. And what happens? I find myself coveting, right? Now I'm trying to do what the law says I shouldn't do and I find I can't. 
So what does the law do? It makes me a sinner because it heaps condemnation upon my head. Okay? Before the law came, I was okay. I didn't recognize that I had a problem with coveting. I was living my life peacefully and I'm, I was at ease. Then the law comes and says, thou shalt not covet. And all of a sudden, I'm in problems. The law has made me into a sinner. Paul says the law stirs up sin and this is what he means. I belong to the land of floor spitters. We spit on the floor. Not really, but I'm speaking like how Paul is speaking in Romans 7 here, right? I'm putting myself in the place. So I come to the door and I see the sign. Please don't spit on the floor. That sign was put there for me. Okay. Now I was spitting on the floor since I arrived here on Thursday. And it wasn't a problem to me. And then I come upon this sign that says, don't spit on the floor. Now suddenly, I become spit conscious. Okay? Without thinking about it, I spat on the floor. Now what happens? Instantly now I begin to feel guilty. I'm looking to see if anybody noticed. Yesterday I was perfectly comfortable. Now... I'm looking to see if anybody saw me spit on the floor. And now I'm, I'm starting to become guilty because you know what happens? Spitting on the floor is such a deeply ingrained habit. I'm doing it without thinking about it. I find that I keep doing it in spite of the rule. So what the rule has done, instead of changing me, it has made me a guilty person. It has made me a guilty floor spitter. So it has made me recognize that I have a problem when I didn't know I had a problem yesterday. So the rule has served the purpose of making me recognize the sin that is inside of me. That's exactly what Paul is saying. He's saying that the law is not sin, but I would not have known sin if not for the law. When the law says, thou shalt not covet, I tried not to, and I discovered I have a problem. That's what Paul is saying. I discovered there is sin in me that is dominating and controlling my life. That's what he's saying. So he says in verse 8, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. I was alive without the law once. That's yesterday when I was spitting on the floor and there was no law, right? I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, that is this morning when I saw the rule, sin revived and I died. Sin became alive. Transgression, guilt became a part of my experience because of the law. That's what he's saying. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin. He's not talking about transgression of the law at all. Sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. So, it's very clear that in this passage... Paul is defining sin, not in the legalistic way that people often define it, but he's showing you that the person who is without Christ has a problem, and the law cannot solve the problem. Instead, the purpose of the law is to identify the problem, and the problem is not that you are breaking a set of rules. The problem is that your nature is contrary to the mind of God. Now, just to make it clear that Paul is not saying that this is a condition of a Christian. God forbid. Because if this were the condition of a Christian, it would be sad indeed because it says in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold on the sin. What kind of person is it that you sell? Is Paul saying that we Christians are slaves to sin? What kind of deliverance is that? Could I sing... Free at last, could I say, Jesus, Christ, Jesus' blood can make the, the vilest sinner clean when I'm still a slave to sin? Nonsense. Those Christians who teach this absolutely are not understanding what the Bible is saying. The person Paul is talking about, as I said, is a person who is under the law. His life is dominated by the law. He's responding to the law, but he has not met Christ. And so, Paul does not leave us there because Romans 7 is only half of the story. 
you don't get the other half until you go to Romans 8. Where Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the what? After the flesh, but after the spirit. Because he says already, you read it, he says, um, when, we were, when we were in the flesh, he puts the flesh in the past tense. So Christians are not in the flesh. Unless you choose to go back and build again the things that were destroyed. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That law of sin that was in my body, the spirit of Christ has come and, and, and put a different law at work in me. And now I'm free from that law of sin. Now I'm delivered into a different level of existence. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. That the righteousness required by the law, the righteousness of the law, might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So we are not in the flesh. And see, he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded or to be fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now verse 7, I'll stop. Because the carnal mind, in fact, I'm going to go to verse 9. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. How abominable that anybody should say that we Christians are still in the flesh. But you are not in the flesh. He says it plainly. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ... He is none of his. It's very simple. Very easy to understand when you just take it step by step and go through the entire chapter. The problem, brothers and sisters, is the sin that dwells inside. When we have united our lives to Christ, that is no longer a condition. No longer our condition. As Brother Howard said this morning, if you are a Christian and you say, I'm a sinner, I know, I know the songs are very beautiful. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No. I was a sinner. There are two kinds of people in the world. There are sinners and there are saints. I heard somebody say once, and this is an important point. I heard somebody say this. and I mean, there, there is a lot of... There, there are a lot of preconceived ideas that have, have, have set us Christians into... In the places that God never intended we should be. Okay? Sinners and saints. They are different. Not by degree. Not by degree. They are different in kind. Okay? You're a sinner and I'm a saint. It doesn't mean I'm a little better than you. It doesn't mean you are bad and I'm not so bad. No, that is the world's perspective. The man on the street will say, I'm just as good as any of you Christians. I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't kill. True. Is that what makes me a Christian because I don't do those things? No, what makes me a Christian is because I'm a different kind of being than you, the sinner. You, the sinner, are lost in Adam. The life in you is carnal life. The life in you is in opposition to God. The life in me is the very life of the Son of God. I'm a different kind of person. Sinners and saints are not, do not differ in degree. They differ in kind. Different kinds of persons. That's what God has done for us. And that's, that's, that's good reason to rejoice. That's good news. And we who are Christians, we should not be, 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 be so misguided and so laboring under the sin consciousness like the rest of the world. God has delivered us from, from, from the, the, the dominion of sin. God has delivered us from the way of legalism and he has established us on a different principle. Even the new covenant where the Son of God lives inside of us and produces his own life naturally. Wonderful salvation. 
And like I said, the next time we come here, Sister Sally, it will be longer meetings because there's so much more to say. But um, I'm going to close off at this point for the, for the moment. And I just hope that you have been able to understand what I'm trying to say. I know there are questions, but what we will do is that we'll take a, a break and then we'll come back for a question and answer session. And then we'll decide how we progress from there. All right? Thank you very much. Let us just pray.